Hello and welcome to the bestseller experiment where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark Stay. And I'm Mark DeVoe and we'd like to say thank you to everyone that is supporting this podcast. That is you listening to this right now and all of our patrons. We'd like to welcome our new patron, one of our new patrons this week, Kate Baker. Welcome, Kate. And if you would like to welcome, join in the fun, get lots of extra goodies, pop over to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. And before we get into this week's episode, we want to tell you about a really exciting webinar that Mark and I are doing. It's a webinar from the mm -hmm. Bestseller Academy, and it's all about the number one challenge every single indie author and actually author faces today. Mr. Stay, you probably have a bit of a spoiler on this one because <laughs> you've been writing for many a year. But the big word that we're going to be talking about in the Academy uh, webinar is accountability. And we found that with the 200 word challenge, even that is difficult for some people finishing books. Um, what's your, what's your, I mean, you have different ways of being accountable, Mark. What's your biggest accountability, would you say? Um, well, I mean, that's been a big change for me in, in that I, I would tell no one. I would tell no one. I'd just, you know, curl up into a ball, write my thing, and if it ever got finished, then maybe I'd show it to people. And I think the the thing is you've got to hold your head up high and say, I'm writing something. And it's terrifying because you've put your head over the parapet and people are going to expect things from you, which is always a scary thing. So, uh, but like I said, uh, 200 words a day had helped me get out of the funk at the beginning of lockdown. And I use it every day myself. I'm using it Every, I use it this morning. I went, I went, I went into Canterbury to get my windscreen fixed on my car, and then sat in the Marks and Spencer's cafe and did my writing and, and logged my words from there. Only to discover, only to <laughs> discover it. that they had the wrong windscreen for my car. Apparently, there are fifteen variants, and they got the wrong one. So I'm going back tomorrow, and where oh, I shall no. log my words again. Oh. <laughs> Do you another two hundred words? You know, if you keep doing it, you might get your you might get your full nearly fifteen hundred for the week. That'd be fantastic. But one of the really interesting things that that we've discovered in doing this podcast is the thing that's biggest thing that's shifted in in the world of writing is that. Nowadays, we've got so many options. We can be indie authors, hybrid authors, bloggers, you know, so many different ways of writing. But because a lot of us don't have that major publisher that's, you know, having their whip and saying, right, we need your manuscript delivered on this date. Accountability is the hardest thing to achieve when you're on your own. And that's what that this, this podcast is all about. We're going to be talking a, a lot about the different things that we're doing to help accountability, such as dream declarations, which you probably heard a lot on this podcast. Um, but also, more importantly, the idea of getting a community of writers together. We're going to talk a little bit about what we do in the Bestseller Academy to create accountability for all our writers, because we've seen some amazing things happen in the last nine months since we launched it. So if you're interested in coming to that webinar, it's a free webinar. It's on the 21st of June. It's coming up really soon if you're listening to this on launch week. And it's at 11 a.m. PST, 2 p.m. EST and 7 p.m. BST. And if you're in Europe, I believe it'll be, that'll be 8 p.m., I believe. So, and if you're in Australia, it's something ridiculous like 4 a.m. And I'm really sorry. But the good news is if you register and you can't make it live, you will get immediate access to the recording of the webinar when it's done. So uh, pop along to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com if you would like to register, just to give you that one more time, Academy dot bestseller experiment dot com. Now, Mr. Stay, I saw something that warmed my cockles on Facebook the <laughs> other day. You had quite an interesting week. Yeah, another amazing thing that's come from Unwelcome, your movie that's coming out um, with Warner. But what was the thing that you did? And I believe it was a first, if I'm not right. No, it was a second. Week. It was a second. Uh, <gasps> yeah, I, it's, uh, it's um. I was. I almost didn't. I almost thought it wasn't going to happen, though, because uh, well, listeners, um, I've got a film out early next year, and uh, this week, uh, Christian Henson, the film's composer, recorded the score with a, an orchestra. I think it's the uh, the London Session Orchestra. I know that's who he's worked with before uh, at the glorious. Air Studios near uh, Hampstead Heath. And Air Studios, for people who don't know, I mean, George Martin, Beatles producer, uh, basically knocked that into shape. And I think his son still does a lot of work there. A lot of film scores are composed there. A lot of bands record there. It's a beautiful building um, designed by the same fellow who did the um, Natural History Museum 
if I'm not mistaken, in London. Uh, Just a a cathedral to music, frankly. And um, it was one of those things, I knew the score was being recorded, but numbers were strictly limited due to COVID because obviously it's a very crowded space and they can't just let any old hoo-ha in. Um, But I'd done this before with Robot Overlords. Uh, I I, I sat and watched the score for that being recorded. uh, And that is just a magical moment. And I was kind of thinking, oh, well, if I can't get in, I can't get in. It's a shame. It'd be, I'd really love to see it. And then that morning they said, we think we can squeeze you in. And I just hopped on a train straight away. First train I've been on in about two years, Whoa. which was late. Um, <laughs> and then just made my way there and got there to uh, to see the afternoon session. And it was... It's just, well, it's. I mean, you've been there, haven't you? You've. I have. Well, here's a here's a funny story because you know we we learned a few weeks ago for everyone who's an avid follower of this podcast that Mark and I have a lot mm-hmm. in common, including working in a video mm-hmm. store <laughs> when we were teenagers. And weirdly enough, um, I've I've actually been to Air Studios to watch a a score being written of um, one of my friends and collaborators for Urban Myth Club, which is the band, that's my kind of music career side of things. And uh, he did a film score and nice. he also wrote, he did he did the music for Narnia, Shrek, and a few other biggies. Wow. But I got to go and be there one afternoon. And I tell you what, it was the most inspiring, inspiring thing to see. And But I will say what we don't have in common is I've yet to have my own movie <laughs> scored and watched. And actually that's been, do you know what? It's been one of my dreams though, musically, one of the things, and if you if you're into music, you, you'll get this. I've always wanted to sit in a in a, a concert hall and listen to a piece that I've written being played by an orchestra. That is absolute bucket list material. But for writers creating a film, I think it doesn't get better than being able to hear the score of the movie that you've created from words and then saying there's music. I mean, it's such an incredible transition, it's, right? It's the, it's the icing on the cake and it is truly magical. It's because um, I can relax. This is the part where everything's done. I can just sit back and relax because I Christians and I'm, he's, he's done three and a half of John's films because he, he John's first film, Tormented, I think um, Christian helped him with some music on that. He, he did Grabbers, he did Robot Overlords. Uh, he he's probably best known uh, for doing um inside number 9 the uh Steve Pempton Reese Shearsmith TV show which every week is different so every week Christian has to come up with a different genre of of music uh, to match the mm. the show and uh, he's such a lovely guy as well really really lovely guy so so passionate he's got great Instagram and and he uh, he's always sharing musical ideas uh, he's very very generous with 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 his musical ideas and it's just wonderful and the thing that blows my mind is that these musicians right they come in i mean you, <laughs> I you're a musician you're much more of, you're, you're much say. more of a musician than i am <laughs> but i can mash out a few chords you know i can i can i can have a stab at comfortably you can numb play the guitar. on the I've, guitar I've, okay you know so, i've seen yeah. you playing the guitar you're, these, you're a good you're a, good a little guitarist. knowledge is a dangerous thing that like, you think oh i can play I'm a musician i can play but yeah, these yeah. guys <laughs> they sit there they get the music they've not seen it before okay this is what Blows my mind. They sit there, they open the music, they look at each other, go, Oh, you could do yeah, you ever do that? And then they play and they it's spot on first time. They it's nail astonishing. It. I know. It's, it's witchcraft. Utterly bonkers. <laughs> it is witchcraft. It's absolutely bonkers. And I've got to say, you know, that to to have um and I've written a score, I've written an orchestral score, but I by no oh, means really? am classically trained when it comes to writing. But I had I had it made into an actual score to be played by an orchestra. Nice. Um, but I had to get someone to help me score it, right? Yeah, yeah. Ironically, yeah. that's how my whole music career started, because that's how I met this chap, Stephen, Stephen Barton. Um, um, but the the really interesting thing was is that um it is. It's. It's like a. It, it's like another world that goes on in their mind. I mean, when I play live, you know, I've rehearsed. I've practiced. I've. I've like made sure I know what I'm doing before I go on stage. But like to see people be able to, it's. It's such an incredible talent. And as a musician myself, you know, even I look at that and think, whoa, that's insane. So to everyone out there, um, whoever, everyone actually that I think there's a there's a lot of people that do writing and music together, and I think there's a lot of links oh, between. We've- the left and right brain, the creativity. I think there's a lot going on. I know there's a lot of people. I know Ian Sainsbury's is a musician, one of our friends from the show, and a lot of other people that do music as well. But I think um, Joe Hill mentioned, didn't he, that he practices piano piano before he starts writing. Yeah. Right? And he starts doing it before he starts writing because he said that gets the left and and right brain working. So if you ever need an excuse to start 
not that we want to encourage you to go start like mastering a musical instrument instead of finishing your book, of course. But if you've been thinking about it or you do play or you want an excuse to play, practice a little bit of music for five, 10 minutes before you sit down to write and see the difference and tell us if you notice a difference or if you even have this as part of your routine like Joe does. I think there's a lot to be said, but you know what? We could talk about music and writing and go completely off tangent. Um, but one of the things that I was going to mention <laughs> that you mentioned the London, yeah, last thing, London Session Orchestra. If you actually look into the individuals yeah. who are part of the session orchestra, they're all the people that have played on Harry Potter, on Star Wars. It's all the best of the best they pull yep. together for, for yeah, these yeah. types of things. So you've had some incredible musicians um, perform on that, but what a fantastic. And I was going to say to everyone listening, okay, if your dream is to one day have your book, one day have your book turned into a Netflix series or a Amazon Prime or Apple, uh, you know, Disney Plus, or even, even something called the cinema, which apparently is coming back into fashion very soon. If you have that as a bucket list, why not add it that you want to attend, you want to attend um, the recording of the score. And don't do like Mark does and like get in through the back door, get it written in your contract or learn to play the kazoo and become part of the orchestra market. You not thought of that? I did offer... You might have been an essential piece of that I did offer to play recording. the spoons, but strangely I was turned down. <laughs> That would be a brilliant cameo, wouldn't it? Not only to appear in your own film, but to also appear on the soundtrack playing the most ridiculous <laughs> instrument ever. Like attempted bagpipes for the horror scene. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, add it to your bucket list, folks. Right. You know, there's so many good things that can come out of writing a book. I mean, what other careers or professions have all these amazing knock-on effects? There's not many, really, I, I can think of. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, just, when you think about just, it, music's just, got yeah. quite a few really cool things that happen. Writing, awesome. We're in the right place. Mark, let's talk about our incredible guest today, because this is a bit different, isn't it? It's um, non-fiction fiction kind of mashup, I would like to call. But tell us about Damien Lewis. Uh, Damien Lewis, our special guest today, is a Sunday Times number one best-selling author whose books have been translated into 40 languages worldwide. And for 20 years, he worked as a war correspondent for major broadcasters. He's been to Africa, South America, the Middle East, the Far East. He's won all sorts of awards. Uh, several of his books have been made into feature films and TV shows, which we talk about. His most recent books have chronicled World War II elite forces, such as Churchill's Secret Warriors, SAS Nazi Hunters, SAS Ghost Patrol, SAS Italian Job, SAS Shadow Raiders, and SAS Band of Brothers. Now, you'll see a pattern emerging here, listeners. Now, his say. latest book, <laughs> SAS Great Escapes, uh, Damien tells the uh, seven of the most dramatic and daring escapes of World War II executed by the world's most famous fighting force. And it is an absolutely gripping read. And really, just before we started recording, uh, his publishers got in touch to say that uh, he's got two books in the Sunday Times top 10 bestsellers this week. So Greatest Escapes and Band of Brothers. It's Father's Day. That's probably why. Um, so we discuss we discuss research methods using primary and secondary sources, how to earn the trust of interviewees, adapting history for the screen, the uncanny similarities between narrative nonfiction and fiction, and why history is not static. Now we have some sound grumbles for the first couple of minutes, but we soon sort that out, and the rest should be audio bliss. So do please hang in there. Brilliant stuff. Let's have a listen to Mark chatting with the incredible Damien Lewis. Damien, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today, sir? I'm very well. How are you? I'm um, tickety boo. Thank you for asking. Um, we're here to talk about SAS, Great Escapes, your extraordinary book, Seven Incredible Escapes Made by Second World War Heroes. These are just extraordinary stories, absolutely extraordinary. But when you're compiling something like this, which which ones come first? Which ones make you think, hang on, there's a, there's a book here? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, with pretty much every single one of the seven escapes, I came across them first um, when writing other books. So, um, you know, these were characters who played a role in other books that I've written about World War II, but were not the central character. And there wasn't enough room in that book to tell of their escape in great detail. It wasn't germane, but having read about them and researched them, I thought, my gosh, these are the most incredible stories. Um, and over the years, I've been compiling this kind of hit list, if you like, of the greatest escapes, you know, that the SAS executed in World War II. 
And um, yeah, I just think it's, um, you know, we've had a tough year, pandemic and everything. And I think we need uplifting stories. And these are stories about, you know, that, that incredible human will to survive and never give up. I think we need them right now. Fantastic. And folks, if you're looking at this on, on YouTube, you'll see behind Damien uh, what looks like your own personal historical archive. Is is that how it works for you? You'll be researching on one thing and you'll see something and think, ah, I'm going to file that away for future reference. Yeah, absolutely. So um, with a lot of these, you know, escape stories, I came across, you know, their escape reports, if nothing else, in the National Archives, because what what used to happen in World War II still does happen today, that, that when someone escaped from enemy captivity, they would, uh, it was called an interrogation, you know, they would, but, but it was really a debrief and they would be debriefed when they got back to the UK for two reasons. One, to check they were a bona fide escapee and they weren't some kind of German double agent. And two, to, um, to learn lessons about how to, people might escape better in the future. And also there was intelligence to be gathered as well on the enemy. And so those escape reports are, are the escapees' immediate testimony just after they've they, 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 they've got back to the UK. And, and those are compelling documents. And several of them just struck me as being the most incredible stories. This must be, um, when, when you come across an archive like that, you must be like a kid in a candy store. I mean, where, where, how do you start prioritizing stories? Where do you start thinking, okay, let's tell this story first? Well, that's a really tough question. Um, it, you're absolutely right. It is it's hugely exciting. I'll give you an example. There's a file that I, I've been trying to get hold of for months. And of course, because of lockdown, the archives have been closed for, month, you know, for the best part of a year, you know, and I just got my hands on it about a week, a week ago. And it, it, and it is, it's just the most unbelievable material. The fact that it's a special operations executive file, the fact this, this file, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of pages. And the fact it's been preserved for posterity bearing in mind the totally outrageous acts it reveals i mean these are these are real acts of skullduggery and very questionable legal uh <laughs> principles you know soe ministry for ungentlemanly warfare this is extremely ungentlemanly conduct and the fact the files have been preserved to posterity is just magnificent because I, you know I, I i couldn't believe i was reading what i was reading so yeah it's um it's 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 an incredible journey but how you then select the stories to write, it's a real tough one. I think at the end of the day, it's what sticks with you. You know, when you put it all aside and you've waited a couple of years and, and a certain story sticks in your head or sticks in your mind, as did these escape stories, I think uh, you know, that's telling. Wonderful stuff. I'd like to talk about your research process in a bit more detail. Certainly the thing that I remember from studying history at school was always, if you can, go for primary sources and we're getting to a point certainly with world war ii which is one of the periods that you you specialize in where a lot of those primary sources are no longer with us but in in this case you had you spoke to jack mann who is one of only two surviving world war ii sas veterans mm -hmm. tell tell us about talking to jack and how you go about uh getting those because very often some veterans can be very very reluctant to talk about their experiences how, yes, how do you yes. how do you I, I don't know if win them over is, is the right things. Tell us about working with someone like Jack. Well, Jack uh, is, um, th there are very, very few um, surviving World War II veterans, certainly of the SAS, and Jack's one of only a handful. Um, I've known him now for probably 10 years, so I'd, I'd class him as a close friend. Um, and for whatever reason, Jack, um, I guess he relates very closely to the stories I write, and he, he, I think feels personally involved in them, even if they're not his story. So, you know, he's not one of the seven great escapees, but for example, he read this manuscript from cover to cover in an early draft and bearing in mind, he's, he's, he's going to be a hundred quite soon. So this is a man with cataract operations and, and not in the first flush of youth, to put it mildly, but still very, very compass mentis. And Jack, you know, read the manuscript and he came back to me and it's the kind of comments where he says, yeah, that's the kind of humour. That's the kind of joke we would have cracked there. Or you know, we didn't we didn't use the radio quite in that way. We would we would have put the aerial up this way. It's all those small things which you, as a historian, struggle to get right because you know there are so few people now who can tell you these things. But someone like Jack can because he's been there and he's lived it. Those are the little uh, you know touches of authenticity which I really really value and which you know I I, I couldn't do without that kind of input. So. 
every time he reads one of my World War II manuscripts, I am so grateful. And it's, uh, you know, it's a really edifying experience. Those, those tiny details make all the difference, don't they? They really, yeah. really bring, bring the past to life. They do. Where, when, when you've not got a primary source, where should a writer start? I mean, there are obviously families uh, of uh, veterans. Where yeah. else, where else can, can a writer go to, to discover the past? So um, it's very, well, very often you'll find if you dig deep enough, somebody will have written about it somewhere. So, you know, after the war, you know, 1947, the 1950s, there were a lot of books published by people who were there on the ground at the time. OK, they're not they're not reports from the actual moment, but they are they're as near as you're going to get it. And, and you know, they are their first hand eyewitness testimony. So so they're generally out of print. Sometimes they can be hard to find. Sometimes they're quite expensive to get hold of for obvious reasons. But, you know, if you've got a subject that you want to um, that you're fascinated in and you really want to tell that story, if you can find someone who was on that mission or part of that patrol who's written a book about it from from just after the war, that's a really, really useful and fascinating source to, to try and look into. So, and just keep digging because there's always, always something out there. I'll just give you an example going back to that file I was talking about. So, you know, the operations involved are, you know, piracy on the high seas, basically. That's what it's about. It's about piracy on the high seas mandated from the highest echelons of the British government, including, including Winston Churchill. Just my kind of story. Now, someone will have written a book about it. OK, I guarantee you that somebody at some stage shortly after the war will have given an eyewitness testimony. So in addition to that massive thick file from the SOE, there will be a book out there somewhere. In fact, I even remember somebody telling me about a book written about one of these you can call them Q-ships. So Q-ships are, they're like trawlers, which are designed to look like fishing trawlers, but actually they've got lots, lots of hidden weaponry on them. And they can be used from anything from clandestinely attacking enemy targets to smuggling and everything in between and piracy. And somebody told me about one of these ships and said, you really should write a book about that, that ship and that crew. If for no other reason it included a French female officer on the ship's crew, very unusual. And I filed it where my memory, and it's, it's one of the ships mentioned in this SOE report. I know it is because I recognize the name immediately. It's a very unusual name. So I know there's a book out there. I just need to go back and find that reference. And, and then I can put two and two together and I can start searching on Amazon and Abe and, and all the usual suspects to find it. So that's another source. And then never, never underestimate the families. So, um, you know, again, to give you an example, um, with one of the seven escapees in SAS Great Escapes, this chap called Lieutenant Thomas Langton. Um, and his story is just mind blowing. So he was part of the raid on, on Tobruk in, 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 in North Africa. And basically what happened was they, they, this SAS unit tro bluffed their way into Tobruk, which was heavily, massively heavily defended through the Tobruk perimeter, posing as, as German troops. So they had German uniforms, they spoke German, and they literally went in posing as German soldiers, breaking every known rule of war, of course. And the reason for the subterfuge was so they could get in there and then and then basically signal in a British attack force from, from, from the ocean. Uh, the, it was an incredible uh, raid, an incredible attempt to seize Tobruk. Wasn't uh, successful. And then Langton led a group of men to escape. And so this involved crossing hundreds of kilometers of the Sahara Desert with no food and no water being hunted by the enemy all the way and no maps, okay? So that's just a brief of how difficult it was. But the most incredible thing was, actually, that Langton somehow kept the diary all through that escape. He was, it's, it's written on these kind of pages ripped out of a notebook, and it's the most amazing document because apart from anything else, at times you can tell he's semi-delirious when he's writing it, you know? It's just utterly gripping and so authentic. Now, Langton's private papers, okay, were provided to me by, or copies of them, obviously, by, by Langton's uh, family. So his private collection, and that included not only his diary of the escape, but letters and, and other notebooks and, and photographs, you know, citations for medals. You get your hands on something like that. Very kind of the family to do that. 
um, you know, you have something which is priceless. And that enabled me to tell Langton's escape story in all the gripping detail that it's rendered in. So never underestimate what the families of some of those that you want to write about may have stored in the attic and invariably will be willing to provide if you can find them and make contact with them. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. You mentioned earlier about researching online uh, and also with uh, the lockdown, a lot of the archives have been closed, so you have to research online. Has research become easier with online resources or we're all quite wary of fake news these days. Does it, does it make it more difficult to ascertain if a source is reliable? How does that work for you? You have to be um, a little bit careful about online sources, certainly. Uh, it's, it's important to go back to primary sources, really hard copy in the archives. Um, just because you can't necessarily prove the provenance of something you, that you get online. But, you know, archive provided by family or archive, which is original documents or archive held in one of the archives, whether it be the National Archives, Churchill Centre, whether it be the Imperial War Museum, wherever it might, may be, you know that's absolutely bona fide and copper bottomed. I think it is important, very important to, to make sure you do that. Um, and the other thing about, uh, you know, the archives is that even now, so as we come out of lockdown, lockdown, it's still very difficult to get in there because there's such a backlog of demand. So, you know, you're going to have to be patient and book book a long time in advance. And we're not just talking the UK archives. I'm involved in a project at the moment. It's a World War II project, which is international. And, I'm and I've been trying to get into the US archives for a year, the French archives for a year, and here. And I've got researchers in all, researchers in all those countries and the German archives. And it's, the backlog is enormous. So if you're going to be doing anything like this, at the moment in particular, plan well in advance. Very good to, good to know. One of the other issues as, as well, um, and it's something that certainly when I was working at a publisher, you would hear authors talking about, is that kind of research isn't cheap. I remember hearing Simon Seabag Montefiore talking about having to go to the Kremlin archives or Russian archives, you know, and that takes a lot of research. And it's usually not just one trip. You don't go there for a weekend and it's all done. You're going back and forth or you're spending a long time there. Uh, and, of course, author advances are shrinking these days you know if you haven't got that money up front that makes life a bit more difficult for authors like you doesn't it it does indeed uh, and bear in mind if you're researching in a foreign language as i have been doing with this story an awful lot of it's in french some of it's in polish you then have to pay for translations on top and they are extortionately expensive <laughs> um so you know and you're absolutely right you know don't you can never think of it as one hit in the archives the problem is when you go in the archives you find a file I'll go back to the file I was talking about, the, the SOE piracy file, okay? Having found that one file, okay, I then thought, I wonder if there's any more files like this. So I had a search, and I found a load more, which I think will be about the same kind of operations. I'm like, I want them all. So that's another trip. And then you'll probably have other spin-offs. The research leads to more research. It's like going down the, the rabbit hole with Alice. Um, so yes, you know, and if you obviously if you're researching in foreign archives, you can't afford to keep going backwards and forwards. So it, it can be prohibitive. It can be very expensive. The, I think the the way to address that, if you don't have a, a you know a, a major budget, is choose a story in your home country. You know, choose a story that you know you can go and research yourself in archives which are accessible within your country, and then that should really keep the cost down. Thank God we're not being charged to get access to most of these archives yet. And I, you know, that's really, really that let's hope that remains the same. So, you know, your costs can be kept to a reasonable minimum. Do the work yourself, you know, and 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 choose a story that you can research within your home country if your budget is limited. Excellent. You talked about going down a rabbit hole there. One of the, A lot of our listeners are, will be fiction writers. We've spoken to a lot of fiction authors on here. And one of the problems they have is they can do too much research, particularly yes. if they're looking. And they never know when to stop. Uh, one of the great tips we, we had from authors, Ian Rankin came on the show and he said, well, he writes his first draft, then he does his research because he knows there will yeah. be gaps in his knowledge that he has to look up. But that's not really an option for you, is it? So how, how do you know when to when to stop research and start writing the book? Well, actually, you know, Ian Rankin's got a very good point. You know, it's a real danger to over-researching. Cannot stress that strongly enough. It's a real danger over-researching because you can get 
you can get lost in the chatter. You can get you can't see the wood for the trees. You mustn't do too much research. And one of the real pitfalls of anyone who's writing nonfiction or, or a lot of the authors who write nonfiction is they say, I've done all this research. I want it all in the book. And the book is just this scattergun approach and it's got no focus. It's got no characters. It's got no narrative. There's nothing to bring the story alive and anchor it. No. You know, when you're writing nonfiction, as far as I'm concerned, the kind of nonfiction I write, I bring history alive. OK, you've got to do exactly the same things as a fiction writer does. You've got to choose your narrative and stick to it. You've got to be very strict and rigorous in sticking to that narrative and those key cast of characters that you're following. You've got to know what the plot is and you've got to have a beginning and a middle and an end to that plot. And you mustn't allow yourself to go down rabbit holes. One of the things I really like about getting feedback from readers and I hope I don't say arrogant, arrogant. I'm not trying to at all. But I get so much feedback from, from readers who say, somehow, you tell us just as much as we need to know and know more. You never digress. You just keep to the characters, the narrative and the plot. And you feed us the information we need to know to know why it's important and why we should be reading it and to keep us reading. Do not over-research. How do you make that decision? Often with me, I'm, I'm on the cusp of making that decision with the project I'm working on at the moment, okay? And often with me, it's fatigue. I'm like, I'm tired of researching this subject. I want to write it now. And in the writing, any further research that, that will be needed will fall out of that. But much more importantly, I'll cull at least 75% of it. I'll say, that's irrelevant. I don't need that. That's a sideline, you know? And, and, and that's the key process. Less is more. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Now, one of the joys of history is it's never really set in stone. We're always discovering new perspectives, which can often challenge accepted views of certain events and times, which, you know, we're seeing quite a lot of that at the moment with statues being dunked in rivers. Churchill, who you admire, I admire, uh, for example, is someone sorts, is pinging back and forth from being saviour to a monster. I mean, in short, history is, is complicated. People in history are complex and multifaceted. That's quite a challenge for a writer, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of, of the story I'm working on at the moment because it's it's really germane to the question. Um, so it's a World War II story, and it's about quite a well-known individual, a very well-known individual, individual, a high-profile individual who played a really courageous and ho heroic role in the Second World War. But in these files that I've dug up and these accounts, which I presume have never seen the light of day, or at least no one's ever uh, you know, pulled them out of the archives of, as I have, um, their role is somewhat uh, mis reinterpreted. So they, they certainly became involved in some uh, <laughs> fairly nefarious activities, let's put it that way. You know, they were doing things which were, were on the cusp. Well, no, they were illegal. They were definitely illegal. I mean, they were breaking the law. Uh, you know, you could argue they were breaking the, rule, the, the laws of war as well, but they were doing it for the right reasons, to, to combat and to fight the Nazi threat and, and to win the war for the Allies. And this was at the time, you know, before the tide of the war turned, at our darkest hour, when, when, when all things were, were acceptable in my view. Uh, it, it, so, so the account that I will write will change that person's perception in the world. Uh, you know, some people may not like it, um, but, but, but this is the, you know, this is the true nature of the history that's being revealed. Um, you know, I, I find that really exciting. I find, you know, there's no, there's little point in writing a history about somebody which apes all the histories that have been written before. If you can't bring something new to the table, I, I, I question the point. And, you know, I promised to my publisher there is new material to be told about this individual. I don't know what it is yet, but I guarantee you there will be new material. Well, this delivers on that front. So, you know, I, I'm excited by that. A history isn't static. You know, it, it, it's an evolving journey. Uh, and each each, each author, each historian should really bring a new perspective to, to the histories they're writing about. I mean, I always try to. And uh, you should bring something new to the reader so that they, you know, at the end of the book, they go, that wasn't just an incredibly gripping read. But I couldn't put it down. But I never knew that. I never realised that was the case. Excellent stuff. I've been looking through your backlist. Your backlist is extraordinary. And uh, I can't see any fiction there. But I know you're an, an admirer of people like Robert Harris. Have you ever been tempted to dabble in fiction to maybe have a triumphant ending where there perhaps was tragedy? So I have written one or two um, 
uh, I, well, I've, I've written a, what I call a faction. So it, it's it's right. a fiction, but based upon a true story, because somebody told me a, a story about a special forces operation and said, but you can't really write about this as a true story for obvious reasons. So that's, that's kind of, uh, it, it is a fiction, really, although it's based upon what really happened. But what fictions aren't? I mean, let's be frank about mm. it. I've just finished reading... Um, uh, Oh, his name escapes me. Come on, the great uh, legal thriller writer, John Grisham. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his new uh, book about the serial, uh, the uh, the guy on death row, and it's 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 very very good. I mean, it, it, I think it's brilliant. And of course, it's based upon a real character, uh, a death row lawyer, and a real death row inmate. So, um, yeah, the, the, you know, the, most fiction is based upon what what's really happened. Um, uh, and, and it's about you know thriller writers adapting that to to, to the plot they want to write. But um, I, I go back to what I said earlier. Whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, if you're going to write, you know, if you're going to be a, a a historian or a nonfiction writer, I still think the best historians, the best nonfiction writers that I read, use the skill of the thriller writer of the fiction writer. To bring their history alive, that's re- you know that's real gripping edge of the seat history. That's not dry uh, reference works, and that's that's the key. What, you know, d- don't think that when you pick up a nonfiction book, it should be dry and and and, and like wading through syrup. It shouldn't. It should actually be as gripping as any thriller. Wonderful stuff. I'm going to take that a little step further because I got a, a listener question from Duncan Moyes, who's. Re- He's researching a true story based on two brothers who started as shipyard apprentices uh, before the war and went on to do incredible things. But he's looking to turn it into a screenplay, uh, which means fictionalizing history. But on film, of course, you know, we have it it goes from things like U571, where the Americans discovered the Enigma machine, to, you know, uh, some that have a bit more veracity. Now, a great number of your books have been made or are being made into films, stage shows, TV shows. What have you learned from seeing those adapted, seeing history adapted for the screen without losing any of that integrity? I think you've got to be reasonably flexible, is the truth. I really do. Um, You know, look, you've got a, whether it's TV drama or movie these days is irrelevant. You know, you're talking multi, multi, multi multi-million dollar budgets. And people investing very large amounts of money, and they have to have some leeway to um, to enable a, a, a something to put on the big screen or the small screen, which is going to one be absolutely gripping and entertaining, to recoup from their investment. That doesn't mean I think it's you know it, it's it's perfectly okay to pretend the Americans did every single amazing mission in the Second World War, for example. Uh, it clearly isn't. But but you know I, I've read. Dozens of scripts, dozens of scripts where my books have been adapted. And um, I've rarely complained about the um, the artistic license they've taken with the truth. That's never been the problem. The problem's always been the script writer's not up to, not up to task. It's just not good enough. The script is just not very good. I, I, that happens all the time, you know. And, and even more annoyingly, you get one script by one script writer, which is brilliant, and then a new producer or a director comes along and says, well, I just want to put my script writer on it to do a polish. And it comes back and it's been completely ruined. So, you know, if, if you're involved in that process, uh, having your book adapted, for example, uh, I, you know, I really hope you get, you know, someone who's, who's, who's up to task. I once took my name off a movie. I said, no, I'd take my name off it because the script was so, in my opinion, so appallingly bad. So, don't and the other thing about it is don't ever let anybody tell you if you're a writer that and I'm talking now being an author oh you know it needs a script writer to write a script it does not I'll repeat that it does not if you are a good author and you understand character narrative and plot you will be a good script writer and as long as you can get the distance from your own book to know what may need sl- a slight fictional tweaking to make it work as a movie. There's, arguably, there's no one better for the job. I have adapted my own work uh, once or twice when I've said, no, that, that story is too close to me. I want to do that one. And, um, you know, it's. I used to think that 
you should let you know the the the, the craftsman, the specific craftsman, do the specific craftsman's job. But I've I've completely changed my mind. If you have written a book and someone wants to adapt it as a movie, and you feel that you, you want to script it, then then hold out for that. Excellent advice. And lastly, I'm just looking through your backlist, uh, Damien, and there's a heartening number of brave dogs featured. There's War Dog, The Dog Who Could Fly, Dog Called Hope, Smokey the Brave, Judy, A Dog in a Million. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, I actually started writing. uh, Obviously, I've been a lifelong dog lover. I started writing um, uh, these, these man and dog at war books, for want of a better word, by accident. So I wrote a number of books about you know um military operations in afghanistan and in the recent war in afghanistan and i came across i met uh, a guy called dave hayhoe who um whose dog in 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 afghanistan was won the dickin medal the animal vc so his dog was a bomb an arms explosive detection dog a bomb detection dog so he would be out the front of the patrols searching out the ieds and, and the bombs i mean the most unbelievably dangerous and heroic work you can imagine saving countless lives And I was just captivated by their story, you know, the most amazing um, tale you could possibly imagine. And so that led me into then some World War II, um, you know, dog dogs at war books and 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 some more recent ones. I've written one or two with more recent um, actually special forces guys who um, who have incredible uh, man and dog stories, too. There's an old old saying in the movie industry: never compete against children or animals. I.e., <laughs> if you're going to put a star in a in, in a movie, uh, you, you can't do better than an animal or a child. There is some truth to it, and you know those books prove have proved very very popular. Um, and you know they are they're great fun to write because you know you can bring humans alive, but you can also bring an animal alive too, and you can. Uh, Essentially, you can bring the relationship between the very special relationship between a human and an animal alive as well. And that's, you know, that's fun to do. Superb stuff. This is normally the part of the interview where, where I ask what you're working on next, but you've kind of hinted at that and it sounds a bit top secret to me. So what is there anything more you can tell us? I can tell you about my next book that's coming out. OK. Yeah, so um, so I finished writing... Um, at the start of the year, a, a book that comes out in October. Um, and it's, uh, it's a story of a, a special forces patrol in the first Gulf War in 1991. And it's it, it, the reason why, I, again, so this guy contacted me, a former S- special forces guy said, look, um, you know, I was in, in the Gulf in 91. Um, we got, I've got what I think is a, a, an incredible story. Cut long story short, we met up. And what, what really captivated me about his tale, apart from the fact I really liked the guy, but I think it's really important you work with people you like when you're telling their stories. Otherwise, it's hard to be sympathetic. But apart from the, that fact, the fact that this is a story of survival against all the odds, deep behind enemy lines, uh, no backup, no support, outnumbered, outgunned, yet they survive and they get every man out alive. It's one of those absolutely quintessential stories of winning through and surviving come what may. And that really grabbed me about it. So that comes out in October. And it's uh, it, it, the title's um, uh, Bravo 3-0. Um, and it's just a really compelling story about, uh, you know, one patrol's operations deep behind the lines. Wonderful stuff. Well, folks, uh, if you can't wait till then, SAS Great Escapes is available now. Dan Snow says more powerful than any novel. Damien, thank you so much for speaking to us today and hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy, If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. What a fascinating interview. And it's so interesting to get somebody on the show who's 
who's I mean we've had we've had people historians and researchers on the show before who are novelists but so interesting to get someone um, from the non-fiction world but really it's again I I always go back to this non-fiction is another form of storytelling great non-fiction is often storytelling isn't it absolutely and this kind of narrative non-fiction I mean he said it very clearly choose your narrative and stick to it stick to a key cast of characters you have a beginning middle and end and don't digress and the crucial thing was he said tell the reader exactly what they need to know so much like fiction you know you don't need to go into how they brush their teeth or put their boots on or, or what you know how the alarm clock woke them up get to the real nub of the story the real meat of it and uh, I think and and also it's a it's those little details that make the difference as well, you know. So you're not you're not bombarding the reader with facts. You are enticing the reader. You're getting the reader to lean forward and want to know more. And I think you tease the reader. And again, very similar to fiction the way the way he does that. And it was a great reminder as well. It really it really brought me back to the Michelle Paver episode. If you haven't listened to that, that was one of our early episodes in the mm-hmm. in the first series where I first heard this idea of, you know, if you've researched stuff, don't put it all in the book. It's the last, it's the biggest mistake everyone makes. And again, listening to Damien, reminding us of just how important that was, Uh, especially, especially when you think about the amount of details. I mean, talked about that archive um, that he went to and he pulled out that, that, you know, was it hundreds of pages of, of, I mean, you could so easily fall into that, into that world, but um, to hear him say that so important, and I think mm-hmm. it's such an important reminder to think about. You know, if you're writing historical fiction, it's not about telling everyone how much you've discovered. It's about pulling out those really key nuggets and telling the story around around those facts and seizing everything in the background. I mean, something we talked about recently as well, even with your crow folk st- story, didn't we, Mark? In terms of the, the depths you had to go into, but that must have been a good reminder to hear that. Yes, it's interesting the little things you stumble across as well by accident. So, for my second book, there's an incident on a bus and some glass breaks, and I discovered that buses in the Second World War had uh, little bits of gauze over them to stop the window shut they they knew that bombs would go off and break glass so and little things like that i thought i'll put that in because it's just one of those little details that that sort of brings it to life but i think the key thing the key thing in all of this and you can tell this in damien's affection and gratitude for the families and uh, of of these you know these these service people and also the people we spoke to like jack man is these are human stories these aren't facts this isn't, you know, in 1066, this happened. The, these are human stories. This puts you in their boots. This puts you in the situation with them. And it gets your heart racing. And it makes you, I think it makes you think, what would I do in that situation? Which I think is, I think once you've got that, particularly with uh, uh, narrative nonfiction, you've got the reader because you're thinking, okay, I'm there. I'm there. I'm in. I'm, I've crossed enemy lines, or I, I've got to get across the desert, or I've got to escape from this POW camp. What would I do? What would I do? Here's what this person did, and they made some really difficult choices. What would I do? And I think that again, it's that thing of getting the reader to lean forward. Once you got them leaning for, because facts you remember from school, if people just bombarded you with facts, you're just like, okay, well, this is like, you know, th- this is like, uh, it's there's, it's no fun. There's no joy in that necessarily. Whereas once you're telling a human story with consequences, with with stakes, with thrills then it's um it's gripping it's absolutely gripping and that's how you make history absolutely fascinating and that's what i love about it mm. and i think for a lot of people like the, the some of the stories that that damien was alluding to that he was writing about the horrors of some of the things that happened can be quite shocking and i know it can be a turn off for a lot of people it might, it might not be their thing but it does bring me back to when i was when i was at college actually in my sixth form and early uni years i I actually set up a paintball club, um, more for the fun and the sport of it. I thought, you know, paintball, if anyone's ever played it before, it's it, <laughs> it's one of those things, it's a lot of fun. But I have, yeah, I love it. And yeah. I was killed, I think, mm. right? I was. I think I was killed about like eight times on an average day. And, and what I found coming out of that, that day was how incredibly insane war is and how and so i think sometimes by reading these war stories it can also be a really important reminder to us about um you know how 
how terrible some of these things are and and it can actually be a you know no matter how bad the stories are it can be a reminder about why we have to you know avoid it at all costs um and there's so many i mean so many awful things that have been documented over the years and it must be quite a challenge as a writer like to really because it's not fiction it's not like you're just making it up oh i'm going to make something really awful it's actually this actually happened to someone and there must be quite a challenge for authors sometimes to go to those places yeah, yeah, because you're putting a human face to it. There's a there's a Twitter account I follow, which every day puts up um, the details of someone who died in a concentration camp in the Second World War, and every day it's a different person, and it tells you that it has has a photograph if one survives, tells you when they were born, what their occupation was, um, and where they died, and um, it's it's and of course you know there's at least. Six million of these to get through. So this Twitter account is going to run forever, and every day is is a sober reminder of of the face of history. These are real people, uh, with real stories, and that's what historians like Damien do is is you know brings brings them to life, which is such an essential essential thing to do. Mm, absolutely, yeah, amazing stuff. Was there anything else for you that you kind of really jumped out for you in that interview? Well, adapting to going to the other end of things, which is adapting history for the screen and i was pleasantly surprised by his reply because i i thought he might because i've i've um you know working for a publisher i've met historians before who can get quite cross about the movies and the liberties that movies take but i think it was um i think it was you know because film is not documentary film is a visual medium for storytelling and even a film like i don't know you look at something like barry linden stanley kubrick film where he strived for authenticity, he he um, Kubrick only used natural light or candle light, and to do that, he had to use the same lenses that NASA used for the moon landings. They, uh, apparently, you know, they they have a massive aperture, the biggest aperture you can possibly get. Uh, but even that isn't one hundred percent historically authentic. I mean, they had Ryan O'Neill playing an Irishman for a start. So I, I think you know. If you're looking for some peace in this world, just accept that the movies are not history. They're a doorway to history. You know, you can watch something like Schindler's List, which, again, strives for some kind of authenticity, but actually is is telling a human story. And then, you know, that will take you to the book. That will take you to other books about, you know, the Holocaust and the ghettos and stuff like that. So, you know, it's... um, I, and then we get into deeper questions about truth. I, even books have a perspective. Even books have a point of view. So when Damien talks to someone who was there, these first-person accounts, these primary sources, if you've got three men on a mission, on an SAS mission, and you ask them to tell the story, that you get three different accounts. You know, So the truth is in there somewhere. Um, but I think this idea that there's some kind of 100% pure truth uh, is, is going to, you know, if you're striving for that, you're going to, it's, it's a road to frustration, I think. So, you know, these are all about perspective and point of view. It's funny that you mentioned Schindler's List because, weirdly enough, that came up over dinner the other day with my daughter. Um, she was, she'd was she seen the movie recently and first time she'd seen it and, you know, it opened her eyes to some of the shocking things that happened. And I studied, I remember studying Schindler's List as a book in as for A-level English before it became a movie, before Spielberg got hold of it. Right. Um, right, right. And so when it came out as a movie a few years later, I think it was in 90, 93, I think. 94. 93. Yeah, same, 93, right? Same year as Jurassic Park. Yeah. Right. And so I, I was actually in, in Canada, in Montreal, studying for a year in Montreal. And I remember the day it came out, I said, I said to someone, I said, right, we've got to go see this film. I studied it. Um, I really want to see how it is. It's really powerful. We, we got into the cinema. The lights went down. And then some guy walked out in front, of, as you sometimes have with the kind of the opening night of a, of a show. He walked out and yeah, Spotlight yeah. came on him. And he he mentioned that he was welcoming in the theater something like a hundred people who were relatives of people from the Holocaust. And so I watched oh. Schindler's List in this cinema with people who, you know, this was incredibly real for them. This was part of their family history. These were things that they've been yeah. talking over the years. Yeah, yeah. And it made, I mean, the movie itself was so so challenging and hard to watch and incredible. I mean, if you haven't seen it, I recommend everyone watch it. But no. to to watch it with 
a group of people, you know, that I didn't know, but I knew were present in that room who, where it was so real, made it that much more impactful for me. Um, and I can't even imagine what it must've been like for them watching it. But, um, yeah, again, another example of the importance of kind of docu documenting and creating yeah. a story around things that happen. Human stories. This is it. This is what we're doing, folks. If you're writing, if you're putting pen to paper, you are telling a human story. You're telling your own. You're you're seeing. You're telling the world how you see the world. You know, and and it's the infinite varieties. And you're only going to do it by writing every day, by writing as much as you can, and putting your heart and soul into it. It's that easy. <laughs> but it's this is what we're all trying to do. You know, Damien is throwing a light on corners of history that might otherwise be forgotten. Uh, you know, this is we're we're shining a light on things that are important to us, that are passionate to us, that put a fire in our belly whenever whenever we write. Uh, even though, you know, nonfiction where you, Mr. D, I know you're writing books that you want to help change people's lives, you know, and see the world with a, with a new light. This is all important stuff. So when you're sitting there having a crummy day thinking the words just aren't coming, just keep going because what you write could change someone's life. Good God, I'm starting to sound like you. <laughs> I was going to say, Mark, what? that's amazing. <laughs> I think that we're going to have to put that now at the beginning of the podcast. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I love it. Does that mean I have to become the grumpy old fart now? Oh, fart, is it? Right, okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mark gives me a Social media, I let's do I social media. That back. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry, grumpy old man. Grumpy old man. You're not yeah, grumpy old man. Right. In fact, in fact, you know, I think um, <laughs> one of the most important things we all have to have, I think, as writers, is optimism. Because it's 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 optimism that keeps people going and i think sometimes when we we hear the really difficult stories but we also hear the really uplifting stories that helps balance everything in a way and helps pull us to that place of of a, a you know a hot a hope worthy future a bit like where we're at right now with covid i mean the fact that we're kind of moving into a hopefully a world now where we're getting back into normality in quotes it's this idea of hope and it's always coming out of adversity, isn't it? When you think about what we've been through. So what, what damien has been doing is really showing us like, you know, some of the horrors of what's happening in the world. And, um, and like you say, Mark, every, every book changes a life, whether, whether we know it or not as the authors, that's the most important thing that does happen with every single book, I'm sure. Um, so Mr. State talking to social media, you said that there's lots of, lots of interesting stories, more human stories happening out on the Twitter sphere and, and the like. Well, let's, let's start with, um, let's start with, uh, something a bit, a bit uplifting. So, uh, Kyan Amelie, who is at Kyan Amelie on Twitter, uh, at K I A N A M E L I. Apologies if I've mispronounced that, Kyan. Um, but Kyan said, went to bed feeling like a loser, a failure and a waste. Like, like my work and writing were worthless. Woke up feeling the same way. I biked to work. Listen to the bestseller experiment, and I'm feeling a bit better. And and then a little while later, he said, uh, "This was that was that was on June the second. Yeah, a few, four hours later, finished the first draft of my novel. <laughs> Lots of work to do, holes to fill, an epilogue to write, but I feel at peace. And uh, I I congratulated him. He said, uh, "It's it, first draft is done. It's not polished, but the shape is there. I'm grateful for your support on my journey. Well, Kyan, we are with you every step of the way, man. Thank you so much for that. And if there's any, you know, if we've helped you in any, or uh, more importantly, if our guests have helped you, if they've inspired you in any way, that is um, that is just, you know, an absolute bonus. So thanks for that, man. Excellent. Love that one. And then uh, one of our one of our uh, BXP supporters, Angela Nurse, who writes as Angela C. Nurse, publication day for her novel, uh, Jack in a Box. Uh, so that's out. Big congratulations to Angela on that. I know how hard she's worked on that. She has a cracking YouTube channel as well, which you should definitely uh, check out as well. And then Tom Cooney, who is at Tom Cooney Writes on Twitter, long time uh, listener of the podcast uh, and he said he managed to revisit the previous cover um, of one of his early books a children's book called The Unwitchy Witch which you mentioned on here before um, so he, he, he's doing the 200 word a day challenge uh, which is hashtag 200 word challenge uh, to re-edit and tidy a few things up on his book The Unwitchy Witch and he put a new cover on there and it looks absolutely brilliant so do check it out Tom Cooney The Unwitchy Witch and I asked him I said you know how much did you pay for that and he said uh, Fiverr 
You know, it was a it was found someone on Fiverr, Fiver, a genius illustrator from Serbia. Uh, so wow. yeah, just brilliant. <laughs> and we've we've talked about this a few times. This thing of refreshing the cover art. You know, publishers do it with their stuff all the time. Uh, it's never too late to go back, give it a refresh, and and reinvent it as a as a new book. So congratulations on that, Tom. Brilliant. That's fantastic. And actually, on that note, if you if you want to um, also join Tom in the 200 Word Challenge, you can visit 200wordchallenge.com. Um, if you are if you don't think you have the time for it, you think you're not you don't have the time for writing. That's why this challenge exists. It's to prove the fact that we all can find 15 minutes in our day, like Mark sitting getting his windscreen fixed. Um, but as you can see, with people like Tom, it really does work. That we're hearing so many stories of people that are finishing their books just by doing this 200 word challenge. To so do it, get over to 200wordchallenge.com. Try it for five days. See if you can do it for five days, and then see how many streaks you can get. And the longest streak is your personal best. And then you have to, once you fall off the wagon, which we all do, it's then about beating your personal best. There is no such thing as failure in writing and there should be no such thing as failure in your in your world as well with books. Absolutely. Fantastic stuff. And um, Mr. Stay, I know that one of the one of the interesting things that we're, we've been launching in the Academy this week um, is this ability for people to find beta readers. Because one of the things that we've had come up a lot is people say it's really hard to find decent beta readers. So everyone in the academy is now going to be beta reading for other people because actually beta reading can be an incredibly useful thing to do oh, yeah. as an author. And you've written a course about that in the academy, haven't you? Yeah. Funnily enough, I'm beta reading uh, a friend's book at the moment and it's um, it's it's great fun. And because I'm in the home straight of the first draft of my current thing. It's it's great to read someone else's first draft and you're just like, okay, this is what I'm reading is really good. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's a relief to see that uh, you're not on your own when it comes to yeah. first drafts, you know. It's like, totally. okay, this is great. It needs a bit of work. It needs a bit. So I'm able to make suggestions and it inspires you to go back and, and sort your own work out, which no, I've, absolutely. I've frequently well, it, have to. Weirdly enough, that's what I find from coaching as well when I'm coaching people. I always come out of a coaching session thinking, oh yeah, I should really probably, you know, brush up on that myself. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, it's great. You get a lot out of beta reading as an author. And if you're not beta reading for someone, I think, you know, make sure come well, join the academy and beta read. We've got we've got amazing novels being written right now. But see if you can be a beta reader. You know, it's something you do a lot of, Mark, and it's it's an incredible service to give someone. But it's also such a benefit as well. So um, we're going to be looking forward to launching that in the next couple of weeks. And there's some interesting things we've got. We're going to keep it wraps under wraps for the moment, but there's going to be some interesting announcements around awards, which we're going to talk mm. about to do with the Academy. Um, so if you're part of that, listen out for that very, very soon. Okay, folks. Well, uh, if you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review on your podcast chat catcher of choice. Thanks as always to our editors, JD and Dave. And come and find us. Uh, get drop us a line. We read all the emails, uh, even the ones trying to sell us strange things from other sides of the world. Uh, get in touch with us at bestsellerexperiment.com. There's a contact tab there. Uh, find us on Facebook. We're Bestseller Experiment, and Twitter and Instagram. We are at Bestseller XP. Brilliant stuff. And don't forget, folks, if you'd like to join me and Mark for the webinar on accountability and how you can create that in your life and your writing week, join us on the 21st of June. Um, pop over to academy.bestsellerexperiment.com to register for that. And if you can't make it, register anyway, and you will get a copy of the recording. I'll pop a link done. in the show notes for you folks. That's easy to find. Perfect stuff. Excellent. And to everyone out there, send us your dream declarations. Tell us, tell us how this podcast has helped you. Tell us what you're up to. If you're just about to put a book out, if you've had some success with a book you've written, let us know. We want to talk about it. We want to tell the world. Um, and thank you again to everyone, especially to Damien Lewis, our special guest today. Um, and Mark, for your incredible stories of your continued journeys with your movie and uh who knows what's coming next have you got a release date yet for the movie mark uh no but i can't things are happening things so are happening saying. yeah but 20 yeah. is it potentially next year though right? it'll be i think it'll be early next year it's um it's always a moving feast but uh, well here you go i mean this another reason to listen to the podcast right to uh, mm, get the latest yeah, yeah. on yeah. the scoop i can't I wait I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you something after we stop recording. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah, you see the things Mark and I talk about behind the scenes, folks. Oh, if you could be a fly on the wall. Um, anyway, it's been such a pleasure this week, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great interview with Damien. Thank you again to Damien. And please keep writing. Don't give up. And remember, you will change someone's life with the words that you write today. So get on it. 
Take care, everyone. It's goodbye from Mark 1. And goodbye from Mark 2. Goodbye! Goodbye.